Good afternoon, faculty, students, parents, and friends. I am truly honored and grateful to speak at the commencement for the University of Maryland, class of 2017. That is Xu Ping Yang. Earlier this summer, she had just graduated with a double major in psychology and theater. But five years ago, she did not speak English. She could not go outside the house without a face mask. She was in China. Five years ago, as I stepped off the plane from China and left the terminal at Dallas Airport, I was ready to put on one of my five face masks. But when I took my first breath of American air, I put my mask away. The air was so sweet and fresh and utterly luxurious. Xu Ping grew up in Kunming, the capital of Yunnan province in southwestern China. It's a city with 6.6 .6 million people. I grew up in a city in China where I had to wear a face mask every time I went outside. Otherwise, I might get sick. However, the moment I inhaled and exhaled outside the airport, I felt free. It was refreshing for her, as a student, to be exposed to open discussions on controversial social and political issues. I have always had a burning desire to tell these kinds of stories, but I was convinced that only authorities own the narrative. Only authorities could define the truth. In presenting her own narrative, Xu Ping's put herself in the spotlight, open to public scrutiny. It took no time for her speech to go viral in social media, especially among the Chinese community in the U.S. and overseas. In the days and weeks following her speech, she has received high praise for her courage to speak up and harsh critique for betraying her country. She even got death threats against her and her family for expressing her emotional truth. My friends, enjoy the fresh air and never, ever let it go. Thank you. Who are her friends? Who are her critics? In this episode, we listen to your views and voices about the right to speak freely in America. I'm Mabel Chan, and this is One in a Billion, a podcast about Chinese millennials in America. I'm an American. I grew up in America. I live and work here. I listened to the speech, and I was surprised to see the backlash that she was receiving because I didn't feel like her speech was severely critical of China, and I think a lot of her speech focused on her experience of coming from one place to a new place and learning and growing as a college student. I grew up in Shanghai and I've been living in America for two years now and I go to school in Massachusetts. I'm actually not very surprised that Yang Shuping's commencement actually raises such a controversy in China because given the context of her speech happened in the United States, I think a lot of people with pretty high nationalistic sentiments can feel this as an act of betrayal, an act of a Chinese national not really defending her country. It is an act of losing faces for her own country, so I can see why they are so mad about this. I saw this speech not just as an individual act, but as a statement made as a representative. I know she's not an official representative, but any time um, where you see an all-American group with one token minority friend. I think a lot of times people might learn something superficial about that one token minority, and then they'll extrapolate that to represent an entire race or ethnicity. Like Yang, I'm also a Kunming native. I spent the first 18 years of my life living in Kunming. I didn't once wear or even own a medical mask to protect myself from air pollution. It is an unsophisticated rhetorical device for young to adopt, just to make a point of how fresh and sweet air smelled in the U.S. When she talked about fresh air, I wish it was not just a naive metaphor for freedom, but an understanding of the challenge that not only China, but many developing countries face, and many developed countries used to face, when trying to balance between economic growth and environmental protection. I wish she'd 
be very specific about the location she was comparing to, the name of her hometown, and the name of the city that she lived in, and also the freedom speech. I wish she could give very specific examples instead of just talking about big words. It's like talking smack about your parents. You are the only person who is allowed to criticize them, but you are going to fight anyone if they dare to say bad things about your parents, right? I related to her sense of optimism, her willingness to engage not just an American culture, but to think critically about both her home culture in China and her adopted culture in America. I find it really unfortunate that she's had to apologize publicly and delete all her social media accounts. Because she was harassed and bullied so badly, but hey, you know, like if we're going with the logic of free speech, in this world where free speech is king, it's her freedom to express her opinions and other people's freedoms to react, right? Are those people being censorious, or are they just exercising their freedom of speech? Where do we draw the line? The last two voices you heard belong to Lian Fan and Karen Su. They both have been thinking about the fallout from Xu Ping's speech. They reflect on their own cultural identity as Chinese and as American. How freely can they speak? What matters to them? Who wants to silence them, and why? I began my conversation with Karen. So, Karen, where did you grow up, and how would you describe your views or attitude towards free speech in your early childhood? I was born in the U.S., but I moved to Beijing when I was one. I stayed there until I was eight, moved to Hong Kong for seven years,、um, and then came back to Boston. And so I think、um, earlier on, while I was in China, I think in each phase I felt quite differently and identified with different、um, cultural identities.、Uh, but I never really thought about free speech that much when I was younger, and、um, actually I didn't think about it at all.、Um, and I've only thought about it really in in the context of being in. Liberal American schools and listening to the liberal media saying, you know, free speech is a human right and China is a dictatorship. Lian grew up in Southern California in an area that she describes as a Chinese enclave. I would describe it as the Newton of Southern California, <laughs> for those who are Boston-based. Yeah, I really agree with like the the limitation of speech was really a familial one. Karen and Lian are both in their mid twenties. Their early understanding of free speech was shaped by their mothers when they debated about structural racism and the unequal value of human life. Lian remembers talking to her mom about the Virginia Tech shooting in 2007. 32 people were killed that day. But I remember on the same day,、um, close to 70 people died in Iraq because of the Iraq War and. You know, this was the first time that I realized that human life wasn't worth the same across countries. And you know, growing up in a on a Chinese enclave where everybody was safe and had meritocratic values instilled in them, that idea was very hard to reconcile. And I asked my parents about that. She said, "Like you, like this isn't something you needed to think about." Something that she says to me a lot is, "Can I speak Chinese?" To,、uh, can I say a Chinese phrase? Yeah, sure. 可怜之人必有可恶之处 That Chinese phrase belies a prejudice against certain groups of people. It roughly translates into, "Those who are pitiable must have a despicable side." In other words, some people deserve what they get. I was a pretty inquisitive child, and I would frequently ask my parents a lot of questions and not get an answer. And I think that's、um, where the seed of freedom of speech comes out. Um, it's not really like somebody telling you not to say something. It's just that the thoughts that you've had are not valued or validated. For me, the issue would be egalitarianism, or sort of John Rawls's theory of justice, where you know, under a veil of ignorance, you don't know who you might be born as in society, and so you might want to structure society in a way where the most disadvantaged, marginalized people aren't too far behind. And I think this goes really hand in hand with what you were saying about your mom's perspective that Kalenjer and Bioko Jushu. Their questions about racial hierarchy and egalitarianism would be put down when they hear their mothers saying things like, 
you think too much, or you're, you're, you shouldn't be concerned about those things. And that's where the freedom of speech, or the lack of, you, you start seeing the boundaries of that. Very similar experiences with my mom. Um, I think the sentiment that she is trying to teach me is there are more important things to worry about. What are you going to do by questioning, you know, the unequal value of human life? Leanne and Karen understand that their mother's perspectives are tied to their upbringing and surroundings under authoritarian regimes. She grew up in a totally different childhood than I did. She grew up in a military dictatorship in Taiwan, which didn't lift until she, they left the country. I think her thinking is along those lines, and I understand her perspective as an immigrant, as someone who didn't get to go to school because of the Cultural Revolution. I think it very much comes from a place of self-preservation, of I can't even make my way around in the system. How can I hope to help others? Leanne and Karen feel that their intellectual inquiry about human life and values were dismissed by their parents because it would go nowhere. But I also wonder, do they feel silenced because there's an embedded aversion to arguments within traditional Chinese culture? Yeah, that's super Confucian. Right? Yeah, I, I, it might be reductionist to like just attribute all of that to Confucius, but I think it is about like what role do you play in the, the structure of society and play okay. it well. <laughs> then there's this attitude towards young people as well, that you haven't earned it or you're young, you yeah. don't know. I do sense that a lot of the culture of respect and humility is about knowing your place and playing your part and not being um, impudent or <laughs> sort of um, outside of your sphere of knowledge. Like, you don't even know what you're talking about is the very common response uh, when we might speak up to elders or figures of authority. That brings us back to Xu Ping Yang's commencement speech. Much of the criticism of Xu Ping focuses on her failing the expectations of traditional Chinese culture. Know your place, play your part, remember your roots. I think a lot of people got caught up in the facts or the factual inaccuracies or the exaggerations she had in the speech. Um, but I was more concerned about the overall tone, um, this throwing away of our heritage um, for something better when that something better only seems better because you don't have a complete understanding of it yet. So I think what rubbed me the wrong way is that we're in an imperfect world. Neither countries are perfect. Um, and to pit one against the other as good and bad is too simplistic. Julian? Whoa. I feel like she was actually critical of America in in this in her speech, um, and that's what I really uh, liked about her speech was she talked about police brutality and like realizing that you can talk about that in America, um, and that is a huge problem here. And that's why I think I I am sympathetic towards her because she she wants to ascend that hierarchy. She wants to understand things, um, and more power to that impulse. I so. I sympathize with her, too, in pointing out the inadequacies and the very, very real problems of China. Um, but I think it's the context that I had a problem with. She was probably speaking to a majority American audience who already had this narrative of China as an oppressive, polluted, backwards, um, dictatorial sort of country where people can't think for themselves and are all brainwashed. Um, I think... This, I mean, this, her speech, as well as the reaction, as well as all the discussion that we're having now around it, I think it's all good examples of free speech and bringing an issue to light so that we can better understand it. Leanne and Karen agree that the freedom of speech is a privilege and at the same time, an important foundation for exploring oneself and solving problems. How important is free speech to you, Leanne? I I think it's a right that that is nestled on the top of Maslow's hierarchy. You know, in order to feel self-confident or self-actualized, which is the top two tiers, freedom of speech is absolutely critical. I agree with Leanne that it's at the tip top of the Maslow hierarchy. If you think about it in a way of um, 
expressing any opinion, um, expressing you know your every whim. I think sometimes it can feel like a luxury. I think about it a lot from a academic perspective,、uh, where free speech allows the free flow of information and productive dialogues that can lead to solutions.、Um, and to censor free speech is to sen- to stop the flow of information and to stop progress and problem solving. Freedom of speech is definitely one of those、uh, ideas that, in theory, is very beautiful and elevating and transcendent.、Um, but in practice, it's been weaponized in different contexts to hurt other people. We have tried to reach out to Xu Pengyang via email, but we heard nothing back. We don't know if she's living in pain, in fear, or free. At the very least, we hope she's safe and well. The ideals she articulated on her commencement day still ring out loud and clear. I soon realized that here, I have the opportunity to speak freely. My voice matters. <laughs> Your voice matters. Our voices matter. Yes, your voice matters, and our right to speak freely matters. But what happens after the graduation speech, when different aspects of your identity and values may clash? Here's what some of you have to say. I grew up in Fujian Province, and I studied in Beijing for my undergrad. I came to Harvard for graduate school, and I've been living here for two years now. I live in Boston, and because it is a very liberal area, my experience in terms of free speech has been generally positive. Most of the time, when I'm afraid to speak up, the fear is coming from myself. I would always feel not good enough to offer opinions. I do think that Chinese sometimes overthink too much, which is good and bad at the same time. It results in more careful words and thoughtful opinions, but it's not great for self-expression. So I try to push myself to think out loud more often when I have conversations with other people, and that's how I cope with this problem. Yes, I am more free to speak up on specific issues, and I do have access to more choices. But I have to deal with racial discrimination. The racism towards Asian as a minority group. You win some, you lose some. If it was not because of my identity of being gay, I probably would be in China right now working on my dream job. Whatever view I express on anything, even if it's a moderate one, there might always be people who disagree with me and also people who support me. No one has the ability to please everyone, and there is no need to please everyone. At the end of the day, Xu Ping's speech is only a speech. Let's take a step away from the speech itself and focus more on the actual challenge we face: how to improve air quality, how to protect the rights of citizens, and how to embrace diverse opinions in our society. I worked in the media industry for nearly five years, and that's all about what you say and how you say it. Each word is meticulously scrutinized to make sure that it's on mission and it conveys the exact information that you need. So I learned how to craft a message in the company's language so it matched up with what was being said on television and across different media platforms. My job was to communicate on behalf of the company, but that was a part of my job. On the other hand, as I grow older and develop as a person, my goal has been to be authentic and real. I don't want to underplay the importance of freedom of speech, especially in our country that was built on that and founded on that. But I think even in extremely personal,、uh, direct relationships with, say, a family member or your friends, that there's different contexts in the way that you say things, and that there's Definitely a way to express how you're feeling while you're trying to be aware of what other people are receiving. Now we want to hear from you. Send us your comments. Pitch us a story. Just go to our new website, oneinabillionvoices.org, and find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We want to give special thanks to Sarah Zhou, Hannah Shen, Alison Chen. 
Fan Guo, Franklin Chen, Jiao Wen Yu for contributing their voices to this episode. In our next episode, we interview Kimberly Zhang, an entrepreneur who's graduated from Harvard Business School and West Point, having served combat duty in Afghanistan. How does she, as a Chinese woman, surmount barriers along her way to thrive in a male-dominated field? Stay tuned for our fall series, She Has Overcome. One in a Billion is... Pallavi Katamasu. Eric Liao. Brian Latwinowicz. Sarah Zhu. It is an independent production of One in a Billion Productions, a nonprofit educational media group in Kendall Square, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mm-hmm.